So I'm going to spend a couple minutes and take a look back. It's been 20 years for me. I want to sort of capture, I think, some of the accomplishments and some of where we are today, and then look forward. Um, in short, the state of the county is really good. Arlington works. It really, in my view, is an amazing place that we cannot, should not, ever take for granted. And I'm really proud of all of us uh, for what we've accomplished over the years. There's nothing stagnant at all about this community. Unlike many places, there's nothing stagnant about Arlington. The only constant is change. And what we have to do is manage, guide, help ensure that it's the right kind of change. In our latest resident satisfaction survey a couple years ago, 89% of the residents of Arlington expressed satisfaction. That is about 32% higher than the national average. We now show up on all sorts of lists. Wasn't necessarily true 20 years ago. Best place or most popular place for millennials. Best place to live. Outstanding top of, top of the line parks. Outstanding schools. You name it, it's likely we've showed up on that list, which is a list of comparables to our peer jurisdictions. So um, what are some of the key changes? And a lot of the people in this room contributed to some of these. Um, in the last 20 years, as we, as we have transitioned to a more urban community, we have added 9.5 million square feet of office space, a city in and of itself. 2.5 million square feet of retail, 2,700 hotel rooms, 29,000 plus residential units. Most of those multifamily. The multifamily stock grew by 41% over those 20 years. It's now 65% of our housing stock. Most of that growth occurred where we'd like it to be, in the metro corridors, connected to our transportation system, not in the single family neighborhoods. Single family residential Detached homes increased only by 4%. That residential part of our community is still that residential part of our community. The challenge in those communities is the houses are getting bigger and the trees are coming down. That's a different question. Population growth over that time, 20% over 20 years, about 1% a year, 36,000 residents. School population, especially in recent years, continues to grow remarkably one of the unchanged items, unemployment rate, remained consistently low, the lowest in the Commonwealth of Virginia at about 2.5% right now, far below the state and national numbers. And listen to this one in honor of the Valor Awards. I asked, what was the crime rate 20 years ago? Crime rate has decreased 57.7% since 1997. The grand total of part one offenses, these are the big ones, the ones we know about as determined by the FBI, homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. 1997, 8,307. In 2016, 3,500, a 37, 30, a 57, 58% decrease. Those are some very significant statistics. So then I said, well, what, what, for the average person walking around, what do you see that's different? What's changed in the built environment? Or in fact, for some of those policy wonks, some of our plans, what are some of those master plans? This is not a comprehensive list. This is just a list. Some of the highlights. Right down the road, Longbridge Park. Used to look a lot different. Potomac Yards, right up the road in the other direction, wasn't there. Village of Sherlington, quite a new expansion to that Village of Sherlington, anchored by Signature Theater. Columbia Pike, complete revitalization plan in place, form-based code created to help incentivize that. The county now owns Columbia Pike to be able to make changes there more expeditiously. Anyone ever been to Clarendon? <laughs> in 20 years, a bit of a change. Clarendon Market Common, sort of anchored by that Whole Foods. Completely re-faced re 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 uh, re uh, Clarendon. 
Roslyn, whole new second generation of redevelopment with the CO Roslyn zoning, just about to uh, embrace the opening of the new twin towers at Central Place with a fabulous observation deck in the commercial building. The community facility plan a couple years ago, award-winning, Arlington Mill Community Center and Residence on Columbia Pike, an incredible joint project, affordable housing and a community center. How about Pentagon City just down the road? Pentagon Row wasn't here. Met Park and all the development under, uh, underway there. Then you can look at Boston. We got a Boston Quarter development. What a huge magnet that will be for our Boston community, and don't forget the Capital Ice Skate, Capitals Ice Skating Rink, that public-private partnership preceded it. And I understand Boston Quarter is already 50% leased, and within the next month, it's likely to be another 15% leased. So the plan's working out long before it's open. Transportation, it's a different world. 20 years ago, we didn't have an art bus. <laughs> the system hadn't been created yet. Capital bike share, car share. None of those choices were available to an Arlingtonian. The community energy plan was created thanks to all of you. The business community was really the dominant factor at the table, the dominant voice from property owners to businesses, the chamber, uh, and we came to a consensus about what this community should be striving towards in terms of our energy future and sustainability. And we created, in the early 2000s, the lead bonus program for the development community and for us. It's a win-win. Two more. For those in higher ed, Matt and others, a couple new facilities, Virginia Tech, Marymount, GMU, all increasing their presence and footprint here in Arlington. And finally, schools are everywhere in this community. They're some of the only large buildings in the neighborhood areas. A, well over a dozen new or renovated schools, including all of the high schools. And I understand, I believe, from our work with the school board, there are five schools coming online by 2019. So a couple of the key challenges we faced over this last 20 years and responded to, I'm gonna just list six of them, I'm not gonna get into a lot of conversation on them, but 9-11 uh, certainly rises to the top of the list and I think we responded with distinction and the Pentagon was rebuilt and Arlington did our part. BRAC, 2005, happened to be chair that year too. It's like I was a magnet for challenge problems uh, Crystal Cities, what did we do? You know, we didn't just roll over, we created, we, we turned lemons into lemonade, we redesigned Crystal City with the community and created a Crystal City sector plan. Then you had the Great Recession. We eliminated a lot of staff, a lot of FTEs. It was a difficult time, but we preserved our social safety net. Another challenge, office vacancy. Now this is one that still exists. It'll be in my next list too. 5.7% vacancy in 1997, today 18. Not unusual in the region, but unusual for us. So what have we done? We bolstered economic development, we were much more aggressive, we've gotten some recent successes with Nestle, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, National Association of Corporate Directors, and some expansions with Lidl, with Bloomberg, BNA, and with WJLA, so we're working hard at that. Housing affordability, another one of the challenges, number five. And you know, from 1997 to 2016, in that nearly 20 year period, uh, we put in close to $100 million to assist in that is area, we, which helped to create about 5,200 units of affordability. At the same time, we lost 16, 17,000 units. Not quite equal. We're working at a deficit. More needs to be done. But we did adopt an affordable housing master plan to help guide us. And the last one I'll list is the streetcar divide. We set it aside, we held our community together, and we have kept moving forward. 
So now I'm going to do the uh, top 10 recommendations for ensuring Arlington's long-term success. These are, I'll tell you, these are off the top of my head and um, they'll change. I think it was kind of a fun exercise for me because as I go through the last six months here, I'm gonna keep revisiting these top 10, this top 10 list, but let me share it with you. My top 10 recommendations for ensuring our community's long-term success. One, uh, number 10, no, you start with 10. <laughs> you don't start with one, you gotta keep everyone in suspense, right? Number 10, ensure government works for everyone. So whether that's customer friendly services, permitting, websites, you know, we need to continue to remain accessible and, and have integrity in the way we do it. So ensure government works for everyone. Number nine, I wrote, stay nimble. What I mean there is adapting to the changing business environment, whether that's the federal government downsizing, business restructuring, or the trends in retail from bricks and mortar to online, we have to be creative and resilient and aggressively claim that space for innovative startups. Number eight, move forward boldly to ensure environmental sustainability. In light of the president's recent abdication of responsibility around climate change, it's a big thing for local governments to get our arms around because we know we can't do it all. But when we package this in terms of our community and our environment, there's a lot we can do. And we have been and should be, stay a model for others. Here in Arlington, that community energy plan I referenced is our blueprint. And in my view, climate change is the number one moral issue for the nation and the world. While at the local level, that is probably housing affordability. Number seven facilitate an even broader constructive civic engagement in decision making, sort of broaden our tools and our opportunities and the, the range of, of engagement we have with the community. I believe the Arlington Way works. It's an opportunity for anyone to have a voice in the decision making, not to be confused with getting your way. I've had many people throw the Arlington Way at me Oh, it's not the Arlington way. Well, that's because it's not working out exactly as you'd like, but you have had a voice and you have had a constructive input. My caution in this is that as we have, we have to always find the balance so as to not allow a few voices to defeat or delay, and the Arlington way is expensive and time consuming. So if you allow those few voices to dominate, you will in fact discourage the rest of the voices. Number six, never, 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 ever put our triple, triple A bond rating at risk, which gets to our fiscal responsibility. You don't hear me being proud to be conservative very often, but around fiscal responsibility, I am, and I believe we are. We have many self-imposed fiscal policies, and we should never abrogate those, despite the challenges, despite the pressures. We have bolstered our auditing and expanded our hotlines, and they should be used responsibly and not politicized. Number five, invest more and find new tools to create and preserve affordable housing. I've already spoken to that, but this is our most significant intractable <clears throat> problem because we are victims of our success, and the more we succeed, the more challenging that issue becomes. It's not just a moral issue, it is an economic issue for this community as well. Number four, continue to act as a regional leader. <clears throat> We're a small place, relatively speaking, compared to many other, you know, Mayor, uh, Montgomery, Fairfax County, but we have an oversized voice and role in regional issues. And our prosperity is tied to the prosperity and the success of others, the district in particular. And I'll only point to Metro as a great example, and I think that's one of the questions you've asked. We have to provide dedicated new funding that's sustainable for Metro, and the future of this region, I believe, depends upon it. If Metro falls, many dominoes will follow. Number three, <clears throat> 
Anyone that knows me is going to recognize this word. Plan, 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 plan. Continue to plan. <clears throat> we got a lot of great policy wonks and geeks in the county, thank goodness, that understand the value of planning, of long-term planning, not just doing something for tomorrow or for that person yelling or you know, for the next election, but doing things that make sense that take time. And we are guided by good policy with input from all of you. It's our bread and butter, <coughs> excuse me, effective, solid, inclusive, long-term planning. And there are always going to be some new issues to address. And I'll raise a few. Impact of vacancy rates on existing new office buildings. The edge development along some of our corridors. Adaptive reuse of structured parking. If, in fact, we're success successful as an urban place and, and having fewer single car uh, trips, or even autonomous vehicles, what the impact of those vehicles will be. Maybe we'll have to rethink those structured parking garages. And then, Scott already mentioned it, home design for aging in place, <laughs> right? So long-term strategic investments need to continue to be made. <clears throat> and in this vein, I'll just mention the Columbia Pike Premium Transit Service, the Crystal City Street Network, and Longbridge Park. And finally, in planning, I did want to do a quick call out to Lee Highway. We've done work on, uh, on our metro quarters. We've done work on Columbia Pike. And next, Lee Highway, the other big opportunity. That is, in my view, a huge opportunity, and it will not be easy. Last two, work collaboratively and efficiently to use our limited land wisely. As our population grows, as our school population grows, the community facility study taught us our greatest scarcity is land. With a lot of growing needs, we have to continue to find the most efficient, most effective, collaborative way to use that scarce resource. And our Joint Facility Advisory Committee, we had a meeting last night, schools in the county, <clears throat> is a terrific start in that effort. Finally, above all, <clears throat> maintain our commitment to be a welcoming, inclusive, and compassionate community in this difficult period in America being so divided and our immigrant community feeling threatened. We have to maintain our values. Our most vulnerable residents will be feeling more pressure. Our nonprofits will be called upon, but this is the soul. Without the soul, none of the rest works. So, Thank you for having me today. All right, all right. Thank you, Chairman Fazet. We have a couple of questions for you, which have been provided in advance. You've talked about some of them, but nonetheless. The first one, Metro, Metro, Metro. Um, I know you had a major meeting with the board with the general manager in the last week or so. What structural changes do you believe must be made to restore users' faith, and what funding source or sources would you champion that you think are realistic to get the system back on track? Okay, and it's a great question, and for, uh, for all of us, we read the paper. Um, it's a huge issue, as I mentioned, for the region. Um, <clears throat> Christian Dorsey is the county board's rep on the Metro board, and, and I am serving on the Metro Strategy Committee, which is a number of regional leaders uh, working through the Council of Governments. Our focus is a lot on the funding sources. Um, I guess I'll back up and say that um, Paul Wiedefeld, I believe we all feel, everyone I've talked to, no matter where you, um, what you believe the outcome should be here, respects the work that he has done, writing the ship, taking the hard, making the hard decisions, whether that's uh, cutting positions, looking at efficiency within his organization, prioritizing safety and reliability with the Safe Track program, which was a tough, tough call to make. Uh, a lot of riders are, have gone in other directions, and the goal is to provide that reliability and safety and pull them back. Uh, in, in, in my view, I've seen over 20 years, a lot of studies done, a lot of studies recognizing that this is one of the only systems in America, transit systems without a dedicated, where you can count on that funding source, where you can bond from that funding source. We have to do that this time. It has to be new revenue. It has to be dedicated revenue. 
I am not one that believes that the board structure is the source of the problem. Uh, you can have a smaller board, a larger board, a mid-sized board. It, it all depends who you appoint to the board. Um, the people on that board, and most of them over the, over the course of time, have been fine. But I really think the focus now is less on opening the compact and changing the board than it is supporting the management. There's good, strong management and finding the dedicated funding source that will provide the funds. Uh, I have to thank the chamber. Um, the chamber just signed on. This is not just the public sector. This is the private sector. This will never work if the private sector doesn't support it. And the business community stepped up. It was in the post just in the last week. And the chamber was one of those many chambers and business organizations that signed on to essentially a set of principles very similar to the ones that the council governments have signed on to and the transportation planning board that I serve on. If you ask me the specific funding source, that is one where there is still quite a bit of, of play and uncertainty. Uh, the one that is um, supported by the majority of the public is a regional sales tax of one penny which seems to have many things going for it. It's one penny across the board. It doesn't disadvantage Virginia, Maryland, DC because it's one penny applied equitably. It reinforces that this is a regional tax for a regional system, which is fundamental to the regional economic success. On the other hand, there are, particularly the Virginia General Assembly is the challenge here in that no, the sales tax generates a little more proportionally from Virginia than it does from Maryland or DC. So there is the alternative is just tell each large jurisdiction the amount they're responsible for and let them figure out how to do it. That's the alternative that, that everyone is working through. But ultimately the timeline, uh, we have to get something together by next spring. If not, I can tell you, and it's gonna come up in my next question, <laughs> The, the local governments in Virginia are going to be in a really bad way um, because just finally, to, to, what people don't know is that the funding mechanism for Metro is different in Maryland, Virginia. In Maryland, the, lo the state covers the responsibility, the funding for, the co for Maryland. In Virginia, the localities <laughs> have that primary responsibility. We do get some money passed through from the state, but the majority of the money doesn't come from the state. It comes from Arlington residents, Fairfax residents. We put in about 70 million bucks a year in Arlington for operating and capital. And we cannot keep, uh, we increase the tax rate by a penny and specifically to meet that 8% increase in our responsibility this past year. We cannot, it's not sustainable. So we have to find a dedicated revenue stream I think it's still a debate whether it'll be a regional sales tax or whether it'll be sort of whatever works in your locality. But we do need you to keep pressing to make sure we get to the end point. Thank you. And to read what you said, Christian Dorsey is the county board rep to the WMATA board. To the WMATA board, Christian, yep. Okay, question number two. What, <laughs> now it's only, we're only halfway through the year, but what has been the board's biggest success in 2017? And while you won't be on the board, what do you see as the biggest challenge in 2018? Well, I'm, I'm going to just build a little bit on what I've already said. I, th I think if I looked at 17 and it's not over, so I'm hoping we have a whole lot more successes to talk about before the end of the year, but it'd be hard not to point to the Joint Facility Advisory Committee as an outgrowth from the Community Facility Study. Um, that really, that Community Facility Study uh, gave us a blueprint for how to address our facility needs uh, and those are both on the county side from population growth and they're on the school side from growing enrollment from a great school system. So that I would say the creation of that which we appointed jointly with the schools, I think it's about 21 people. We specifically identified and carefully, th I, I, we had a lot of applicants, people interested, which is really a tribute to the county. But we focused on people that had a county-wide perspective not a more parochial uh, or, or singular issue. Uh, and we met with them last night for the first time in a work session and they produced some terrific work for us. And um, I think that, uh, that uh, sort of uh, Joint Facility Advisory Committee as a reflection of the need for that collaborative work with the schools 
is working. So the biggest challenge for next year, um, uh, I think, will be around the budget. I'll point to the, the budget drivers this year were metro and schools, and that's why the tax rate was increased to cover those needs. Next year, I spoke to metro. We have to deal with that. Um, the other one is school growth, and I think it's going to be a challenge as everyone focuses on with growing enrollment how the school budget remains sustainable. It's not really right now. The way it's done right now is not sustainable. <clears throat> and it's going to be important that we jointly look at reducing the per capita cost of the students. <clears throat> and that means looking at some of the big budget drivers in the schools. And I think that's going to be a big challenge. OK, thank you. Number three of four. I don't think anybody in this room would argue that the relationship between the county government and the business community has improved tremendously in recent years, whether it's working with the chamber or Shannon Flanagan Watson, who's been the business ombudsman. Um, but what areas do you see, what opportunities do you see to make the county even more business friendly in years to come? Um, I think the relationship is good. I think the community, I, I tell people in other parts of the state, we're the most business friendly place around. When you look at the win-wins we get in our development world and uh, what we've created here, I just referenced all the growth. That said, it's always important to continue to provide the, the most f sort of customer friendly. So what, permitting, you know, it's an issue for businesses. It's an issue for contractors. It's an issue for residents. How do we continue to, to improve our customer service by making our permitting process more understandable, more simple, uh, while at the same time having the protections built in that the neighbor next door wants and that we all want. So to me, that's one way we can move forward. Our site plan process where we get the large developments, it's consistently reforming. Um, we have now this opportunity to come in sort of pre-submission and get some really good feedback that uh, allows a developer to not invest huge amounts of money in that refined design of a building, but to come in earlier and get make sure they're on the right track with the density and the bulk and the massing. Um, so I think how you design that process also helps some cost avoidance down the road. Um, you know, I, I've said before, we're, we're our economic development department, I think we have really bolstered and we got a great staff doing great work right now. We're being much more aggressive. We used to have a 6% vacancy rate without trying too hard because the community sold itself. Now, for a whole variety of factors, it's more competitive out there, whether that's the silver line or the federal government or pulling back um, or other people just learning how to create communities more like ours that have the amenities and the appeal. But we'll always have some of those assets, whether it's the airport, um, and, and the uh, outdoor restaurants and the things that make Arlington really special. Um, I am not a big fan of the incentives that we have begun providing, but I do know why we do them. I will, don't think it's smart for us to unilaterally uh, disarm, but I do think that providing those targeted, strategic, surgical incentives where necessary is an important tool in the toolkit. Um, so what we can do more is continuing to, um, I think, Arlington sell, uh, Arlington's greatest, um, uh, the reason people come here more than anything else is because of all the things we do well. Um, the amenities that attract them, the airports being close, the millennial workforce is our number one recruiting tool. Um, and as we continue to build a community that's attractive and do the aggressive economic development, I think we will slowly get to the right place. Okay, and to wrap it up, it's worth noting, it's not in the question, you're, the seat you occupy has only turned over one time in 44 years. Prior to you holding it for 20 years, Ellen Bosman held it for 24. So you've seen all that history. So what do you see as a legacy of your 20 year tenure and what advice you have two of your colleagues here would you give to your colleagues going forward? Okay, you asked me to give my colleagues advice. That's pretty. Um, I'll save that to the very end. Let's see. Okay, it, it's kind of interesting to think about your own legacy. Um, I, I guess it, for me, it would be helping to guide uh, the, over t uh, the 20 year transformation of a community uh, into the urban success story that we are, and change is hard, and doing that. Um, in a way that, that has resulted in a, a community that's a model in so many areas 
of public life, um, while at the same time protecting the connectedness and the compassion of a small town. And there are a lot of things that have to happen to make that kind of a recipe work. And I think most people in this room are part of that success story, are part of that compassionate network, are part of that, that um, technology expansion and the building boom and the transportation system and all the things that have to work together. I often have referred to, um, the, as a cyclist, the, the wheel that I, you ride on. And one spoke goes out and you have to true it up. And all the pe none of it works well unless it's trued up. And whatever piece it is that's out of whack, whether it's public safety or housing or schools or technology, that's what deserves the focus because once they all work and roll together, you get the most out of all of it. So I think it'd be being part of that stability and leadership um, through the 20 years um, of that transformation. And then the guidance. All right, John, Katie, ready? <laughs> okay, I wrote, stay true to the vision and values, ground yourselves in solid planning and policy, listen and lead, and then finally, respect and be informed by the past while continuing to be open to new and creative ideas for the future. Thank you very much. Thank Big you. round of applause for Jay Fazette, please.